So uh, today's agenda, we'll talk about what Teams is, the setup, the creation of channels in Team, how to use chat, uh, some of the app integrations that exist in Teams, and then how do you think about the distinction between guest users and people who are already a part of your team. We'll also talk a little bit about some administrative considerations that you might have when you're setting up a team and you're thinking about administering it for your organization. And then most of our time today will really be spent on a question and answer. We want to understand what you have questions about so we can best answer it and learn from each other to see how you are all using Teams in your um, organizations. So Teams is, for those that might not be aware, I know some of you are not using it, right, is a platform and a communication uh, collaboration platform. It runs uh, on multiple kind of device-based device -based applications, so you can get it on desktop. Many of you might be using it on the browser right now. There's also a mobile application that you can use. But what Teams is essentially trying to do is create a one-stop uh, shop for your platform so you can access all of your productivity needs in one place. Microsoft's goal sometimes that they say is like to have Teams be the only desktop that you need so that you can chat in it, that you can talk to each other in it, that you can share documents and collaborate within Teams, that you can use it to host meetings, to host live events. And so what we're going to try to do today is talk about all of the different features that are available to you in Teams. Obviously, how you use them and what works for your organization is going to be really reliant on how your teams want to function, but the functionality really is pretty robust within Teams, and there are a lot of features that are available. At TechSoup, we've been using Teams for the last couple of years. We use it along with other platforms, so it's not our only thing that we use, but we found it to be a really great and useful tool. One for collaboration, so it's just a repository so that we can see the chats that we've had with people, that we can collaborate on documents, and that we can have one place to go that many people can access to see where we're at. So it really helps us in increasing transparency, communication, and collaboration. And so I'm excited to go through a little bit more with you, and I'm going to pass it on to Kevin for the next part. Kevin, can you see my screen? I can. You can hear me okay? Yeah, so thank you very much, Shruti. As Shruti mentioned, what this is basically going to be is a front-end introduction to the basic structure of how Teams exists. To her point, Teams is very, I'd like to think I know enough to be dangerous on Teams, but the more as I discover and go down the uh, pipe hole here that there is so much to this. So really, I think the best thing to do is just to start with the setup, channel creation, discuss chat, the chat, and then app integrations, and then we'll wrap with get, and that'll segue, we'll segue from the actual Teams functionality to a discussion of, about a slight review of administrative functionalities. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my demo. All right. So when you first launch Teams, the experience is going to be a little bit different, particularly as someone who may be a global admin, the person who has brought your organization into the 365 fold. When you do launch it, as is traditional, like across all endpoints, Microsoft likes to welcome you with pop-up wizards. You'll see it for a lot of things. So just as a preface, this is one that my demo client has already been built out to a certain degree. So this is not necessarily what the initial experience will look like. But moving past that, the basic functionality of creating a Teams team is the same. So in the UI here down over on the join or create a team, you're going to go ahead and click that. You'll click create a team, and then this is going to walk you through the process here. You'll see there's, a, there's several options. Don't be daunted by that. What the templated options are, we're, we're not going to go over this, but what the templated options are basically custom configurations that already have pre-created channels and applications integrated with. We can, we can get into that in the Q&A, but I, for this uh, demonstration, I'm just going to actually start with creating a team from scratch. So you're going to see this pop up here. There are three options. There are a private team, a public team, and an org-wide team. I'm going to actually start with the last one. So an organization-wide team is exactly what it says. Everybody in the organization that's operating within your tenancy is going to be by default part of that team. Those are That is a team type that you'll want to use mindfully. 
Um, only a global administrator who is the person who either created the 365 account or has had their permissions elevated to GA can actually create an org wide. So it's something you're going to want to think a little bit about before doing. Public teams, these are ones that you'll probably most frequently use. These are where you can bring together certain groups, certain departments, certain teams together. Anyone in your organization, though, will be able to join. So if Shruti wasn't a team and I was just out there doing my own little thing and I wanted to join that team, I would be able to join that team. The last here is a private team. As it states here, people need permission to join these teams. These are teams from a organizational and or security perspective that were, are things that you'll probably consider for if you, from a managerial standpoint, maybe between you and an employee for say like your one-on-ones or review from a more of a security standpoint for a finance team, for individuals that are maybe communicating sensitive informations that other people do not need to be privy to. This is a case where a private team might be in your best interest. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click a public team here. I'm going to call this public test one. You can type in a description and then you're going to click create. It's telling me nice work. It's very proud of me. So as it states here, this is important. This is a good thing too to just read a little bit to take your time when doing this and, and anything within 365. So team members can be added by an individual name, a distribution list, or a security group. So Security groups are a discussion either for the Q&A or for another time because there are two different types of groups typically in 365 security and Microsoft 365 groups. But I'm just going to go ahead and just simply type a name because this is going to be a small group. I'm going to just have Adelaide and Adelaide is my imaginary marketing colleague. So I'm going to just go ahead and add her to this group. Now, this is something to take a quick peek at. So when a person is added to a uh, team's team, is that they are added as either a member or an owner. Obviously, membership versus ownership implies two different levels of abilities to interact with a team. So you'll want to decide that when you're doing that. I'm just going to keep her as a, for the sake of this demonstration, and then I'm going to go ahead and close this. So as you can see here that now this team has a team name and by default, when a team's team is created, a general channel is created here within the framework of the interface. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm actually going to let Adelaide know, hey, I created a new team and you're a part of it. I'm not going to spell correctly because I don't ever do ask anyone that's gotten an email from me. So this type of post, as you can see here in the upper part of the screen, is a general post. This is posted to the Teams team channel. Everybody can view it as a part of the team. That is different from, from chat. And I'll step over to chat just for a second, even though it's a little bit further on, just so that people understand what's the difference between a post and a chat. So a chat is a conversation that I'm having privately one-on-one -on -one with someone. So I wanted to let Adelaide know not in the general channel, but through a private message that I added you to a new team. I just went ahead and did that. So jumping back into the, the new team that we created here, you'll notice here on the top, and then this goes into expansion of different things. So as part of the general ch default channel that's created, it introduces a couple of different applications or features, one of which is files. The other is wiki note taking just without getting into a really high higher level like what it is just on the surface. It's just simply for note taking. It's maintained and it stays within uh, the general channel here. It's not quite as flexible as OneNote is, but if it doesn't really the data in there doesn't really need to necessarily be moved around. This is probably the ideal place to put it. Files. This is a big one. So you can actually create files inside a channel. You don't actually need to launch an application. You can simply go to File, New, and then select the type of asset that you want to use. Do you want to create a Word document, Excel spreadsheet, PowerPoint presentation, 
etc. You can go ahead and do that from here. You can also upload files from this computer to this location a a as well. So the thing that just really quickly, I just wanted to talk on that understanding, and I'm not gonna go right into the administration stuff, but you'll see a feature here that is important and because I wanna double down on this is open and SharePoint. When you create a Microsoft team, it creates a SharePoint website for that team. That's worth knowing as an individual and then as an administrator, because you can interact with these resources both here and within SharePoint. If you don't use SharePoint, I wouldn't be concerned about it, but it's just it's something that's just is worth knowing. So the next part here really quickly that I wanted to discuss was the integration of applications. So you can see here on the sidebar that I have several different, we'll call them functions, but applications. So when I say that there's something that I'm looking to do, for example, like I wanted to create like a, a planner bucket. That's something that's integrated within Teams. So it's called tasks by planner and to do, and I can actually interact with to do, which is the more commonly known application that's available as a standalone. And I can go ahead actually and create tasks and task buckets here. This is one that I probably use uh, most frequently. I don't go too far down the rabbit hole with application, but it is one that, that I uh, am fond of. Another one is uh, calendar. So you have the ability to export a calendar, uh, your calendar from Outlook into the interface here. Now, just worth noting is here on the side is that sometimes this acts a little funky, this sidebar. So one thing that you might want to do if you find that um, you're losing these applications from the display on the interface is you're going to actually want to pin them. That reads unpin because I've already pinned it to the sidebar. I've seen it that when you work with different versions, the web version like HTML or the desktop version, or in some cases, even like a tablet version, that sometimes these act a little funny. I don't know if it has to do with scaling, but if you find yourself using certain applications regularly, definitely pin them uh, to the sidebar. So calendar here is where you can meet. So basically have video and or uh, voice calls. If you wanted to, you can create new meetings from here. Also, depending on your version of Teams, you can schedule a webinar like this one, or you can create a live event. You can also integrate applications, third-party applications. We use Asana here. As Trudy said, it's one of the many things that we do. So when you integrate any third-party application, big ones that I integrate are Asana and Adobe, you are going to have to sign in before you can actually interact with that. So I would go ahead and log in to Asana. It will verify, authenticate my login credentials, and at which point then I can go into and actually start to do things in Teams that are reflected in Asana or Adobe. In this particular case, say I wanted to create a new task under a project that I'm managing, I can go ahead and do that here. There's a ton of these applications, a ton. Can't go over them all, but there are a couple that I definitely recommend that if you have in your tech stack, Adobe, Asana, Airtable, there's a variety of them. There's likely an integration if it's a, if it's a major application. So moving on from the applications, I wanted to then go into guest users, and then we'll get to the administration stuff in a second. This is the admin you'll see here in the URL bar. This is the admin portal homepage. So admin.microsoft.com. So from here, from the, the page, I'll go into the, the whole process here. I'm going to go down to users. And I'm going to go to guest users. This is where I can add a guest user. Now you'll see here that there is a hyperlink. Guests have access to Teams, manage team settings. If you go ahead and you click on that, this is what will actually pop up. The, by default, uh, guests will have access to Teams. So you're going to want to take a look here and figure out what's best for you, and that ties into the administrative conversation about how much access is the right amount of access for your guest users. So from there, to create a guest user, I would add a guest user and then invite user. So from the invite user tab, I'm just going to, I'll let you look at this uh, at greater length, but from this redirect name, email address, first name, last name, Tom Green, 
and then the email address. Now, see if you click here, the email address of the user you would like to invite to the directory. Now, this does not have to be a like custom domain. Say you're working with a food pantry and it's, we'll say Tulsa Food Pantry, I'm gonna be biased here, .org. It can be, so if I'm working with Tom, it could be Tom at uh, Tulsa Food Pantry. But also you can add like an SMTP type mail client, like an Outlook or a Gmail client as well for in your tenancy. So then first name, last name, and then you can just notify them, hey, I'm inviting you to, to this team's uh, team and to this channel to collaborate on different activities. So you can then assign them to a group or role. This is a larger kind of conversation that I'm going to just go back to maybe open on Q&A to groups or roles, settings, usage location, and then just some other general information here. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, when you're going uh, through that. Let's hey, see. Kevin, we had, I'm just gonna stop you real quick here just cause we had a few questions, particularly on guest users. So it might be good to just try to address them here. One was a lot of people are interested in guests. Wynn had asked, they ha often have a need to send and receive large files from outside of their organization. Is there anything mm -hmm. specific we have to do to enable that in the guest? That's where you, you like for advanced settings, like within guest users, uh, and then into the Teams admin. Let me jump into the Teams admin so I can touch on uh, some additional things here. Okay. And so. then another question from Felicia was, can we add people outside our organization's email suffix to our team? I'm sorry, one more time. The Can we add people outside of our organization's email suffix? So it's outside yes. of their own domain to that yep. team. Yeah. yeah, so that's the same thing, domain and then suffix, alias, UPN. Yeah, so that you can invite anybody, again, from a custom domain or suffix, alias, domain, or even a general domain. I have somebody actually as a guest in my own personal one that uses an Outlook account. This is where you will go in to address guest access functionality within Teams. So that's, a, I'm glad that this is where we're at because two things worth noting. To the admin component of, again, I wanna reiterate that when you create a Teams team, it does a couple of things. As I mentioned, SharePoint website is created. It also creates a mailing address as well as a distribution list. So for the global admins, for anybody that's working in an, uh, an admin capacity, just so that you're aware that there, there are things that happen on the back end, like that are created in Teams elsewhere. We have resources for that. I actually would be able to get that to anybody that uh, is interested that goes over that whole, the whole topology, if you will. So calling, this is everything in here is pretty straightforward, right? So you look at it, everything's toggle in, toggle off. So calling, meeting, messaging, these are all controlled within this functionality. Now, as far as, as far as information sharing in general, that's something that you may also want to take a look at within your SharePoint administrator, because as I mentioned, SharePoint is like the high, like the king of the castle here, so to speak. And this is like teams is like the prince, if you will. So that's something where you're going to want to go in and take a quick look also at how sharing occurs there. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into SharePoint, the SharePoint Admin Center, and then sharing right here. So policies, sharing. This is something that you will have to adjust. As I mentioned, the organizational guests, you to enable that functionality, you're going to just simply lower this bar here. I love how like simple this stuff is right here as far as you don't need PowerShell, you don't need any of this crazy stuff. You just go ahead and then just move sharing to enable that because again, all this stuff is technically really in SharePoint and it just happens to be either created and or secondarily housed in Teams. So you'll go ahead and you'll make you'll make that change and then you'll go ahead and, and save that there. Just so that real quick, since we're on this, OneDrive cannot have an elevated position above SharePoint. Just an FYI, SharePoint controls SharePoint, OneDrive, and Teams as far as permission level access. So hopefully that helped um, in answering that. Let me close some of these out here. All right, but this is also, again, this is for the guest access. So you want to take a look here. So between guest access and things, think SharePoint Admin Center, and then thank Teams Admin Center. Again, everything typically terminology wise, if you're struggling to find something, 
the key words really to always look for are configuration or policy. Those will answer probably two thirds of all the uh, configuration questions that you'll have, like where do I go to do this? That's where you'll go usually. So this is how all of this is controlled. You'll want to take a look through this. Any changes that you make, because these are the default settings, I haven't touched this, you would just go ahead uh, and save that there. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the home here, if it's going to let. So this is the Teams admin homepage. So this really quick, you have a global administrator who was created, associated with the creation of this. Hopefully your organization has at least a secondary global administrator. One thing that's worth considering, because I saw from the poll earlier that a lot of people over half are actively using Teams, and then even for those that aren't, I would recommend using the role-based access control to elevate someone's permission to be a Teams administrator. I can, do we have time for that, Trudy? Do you want me to go through showing how to elevate to Teams admin? I think that would be helpful because we've had a few questions on it. So I think okay, perfect. Great. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'll go into active users and say that I, I'm picking on Adelaide. Say that I want Adelaide to be a Teams admin, and this you can do with anybody. There's actually 60 different RBAC roles. If you're small or big, it doesn't matter. My opinion is, like many hands make light work. So if you have people that are willing to say be a Teams admin or an Exchange admin and, and from a security position you're comfortable with it, have this conversation so that one person isn't doing all the work, if of course that's appropriate. So I'm going to go ahead. So I clicked on Adelaide's name here, display name here, and it brought, it brought the, if I scroll down here to roles right here, I click on manage roles. I click on she by default she's a user which which everyone but a GA will be. I go to add the admin center and then I click on Teams admin and then I would click save changes. You have a question what any of these admin roles are? Right over to the circle info circle and then it explains exactly what it is. So, I'm going to go ahead and then just click save changes. And now she is a Teams admin. I close some of these out. Okay, so some considerations here really quick, and I'll leave this to the questioning, and then this is probably going to be more conversation perhaps for some people as well. So Teams policies may or may not be something that you want to take a deeper dive in. Okay, so from here, it's very similar to the general admin.microsoft homepage. You've got, but it's obviously addressing specifically Teams. So you've got things like users, guest access, external access, Again, this is where having a Teams admin, a competent Teams admin administrator would be very helpful. Then you can get into things such as policy packages. Do you work in an industry that requires, deals with PPI, PHI, like different types of things like ISO certifications, et cetera? I don't know them all because it's not my forte, but there are things like policy packages that you may want to take a look at. Are you in educational services? Are you in the financial industry? What these packages essentially do, and they actually do a very good job of explaining it here. This is a policy, for example, with the financial for addressing banking related PPI. If you know that you are going to be dealing with that or certain teams are going to be dealing with it, applying these policy packages to those teams is very advantageous, especially if something like auditing comes down the pipeline, very important. Are you in healthcare? Are you a HRSA? Are you a rehabilitation clinic? These types of things. These are definitely some of the additional packages that you're going to want to look applying to, to groups that are working and operating within teams, patient information, clinical workers, et cetera. As you can see here, there's quite a few in this list. Again, this is something to, to definitely go exploring here. There's things such things like messaging policies, right? So you can create customized, there's a default policy that's assigned. These are the types of things that you're gonna wanna take a little bit of a deeper dive at from an administrative standpoint when you are interacting with Teams. If you wanna use Teams, it's an amazing platform, but just understand like, what from, what's my security? What are these things that, that we should be concerned about? And, and have a plan for adopting Teams. And that's what things like Teams Advisor are for. I won't go too far into that, but there are, just know that there are resources that Microsoft makes available 
to help you launch this from beginning to end. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. I, I'll start getting us into the questions because I see them coming in right now. There's a few questions about calendars, so I'm going to go to those. One was from R.E. Pruitt. Is the calendar shareable with the team? So are those so, calendars shared? To, yeah. Go yes. Ahead. Yes. So is it the from the distribution list? So that's where that comes into that is is by creating that list. It, you can house a calendar or shared calendar in it. So that's what sometimes IT admins get a little, oh, why do you keep creating teams? And it's because it creates these other resources uh, that you could use to leverage to create calendars and other things. Okay. And then I think coming off of that, John asked a question, which I know that a few people were looking for answers on as well. John's from a behavioral health organization. And so he had two questions. One was, what is the best way to do centralized scheduling in teams where our schedulers can create appointments for providers with clients without cluttering up schedulers calendars? Using the schedule function within teams. That is actually an application. Let me see if I can pull that up here real quick. A scheduler. It is an application in here. I will find it because I, I have okay. used this before, but yeah, just if you can mark that one. What we'll do is John will uh, follow up and we'll send that and then we'll add it to the resources on the slide. So if anybody else wants to look at it, they can see it as well. The other question that John had was, what are the best methods to use Teams in order to capture signatures remotely by clients? Approvals. Please don't let me be 0 for 2 on this one. There we go. <laughs> right here. Do you just... Can can he if he could answer into the do we do we want to do you want me to enable the do you want to just take them in like the yeah, questions sure, in could, yeah 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 sorry. okay yeah if they have Adobe Acrobat DC I would probably use Sign it's included in there and then that's a third party app integration that's what I've used I don't it's not that I have anything against the SharePoint automation for approvals it's pretty easy if you if your team wanted to use that but I like the idea of just logging in and the system knows like what it's asking for. So it's just going to be displaying the assets just that you need. It's not going to be taking you through uh, several steps. John also had a, had a clarifying um, question, uh, question to the scheduling. That is not really a question, but just say, clarifying that the scheduler would not actually attend the appointment or want it in the calendar. So when we follow up, just to note that, that there's probably okay. some things, yeah. Okay, yeah, there might be uh, so some different considerations. Yeah. Okay, great. And then Tom asked, is it what you're looking for? Um, scheduler is the same as bookings, but it is a little different, right? It's different. S schedule has a, like a slightly different integration and backend versus bookings actually communicates with Outlook to, okay. to generate the user interface and how that's constructed. So bookings is a really cool and easy interface to work with. I would probably recommend at first looking at bookings from creating that from a bookings perspective as it's through the app dedicated application endpoint and then carrying that over to teams because if you have several people that are going to be using bookings having some a little bit of control over how it happens and is deployed might be worthwhile because you're, you might find people creating at like assets duplicate assets or creating like unnecessary like calendars that don't necessarily communicate with each other unless you're really as an individual keeping uh, tabs on everybody's calendar. It's, it can be clunky, but it, it can come straight from teams and be managed through that. But I would go through the bookings app first to understand the hierarchy of it. We also have a question just because I know we were starting to talk about some third party apps as well is do third party apps require specific licenses or do these incur additional costs and what's your um, recommendation regarding allowing users to add third party apps? I'm trying to to the last part I'm trying to think <laughs> like how to like be like a non-admin and then admin at the same time because I, I have a reputation for asking for a lot of things so Technically, what you can control applications through the Teams admin portal, the third party applications. Uh, you can actually control third party application integrations also through it depends really how you want to manage that. From an IT security standpoint, depending on the nature of what it is that you do, I may lock it down if I'm in something like healthcare or financials, like dealing with that, that might be leaning that. The marketplace is great. I've heard literally nothing bad about it, but I also think, do I necessarily want people interacting with things that are not in an improved list? So approved applications can also be published internally. I'm specifically using Intune for those that have Intune functionality in their licensing. So 
I would probably at the very least open up popular applications use like Adobe, again, Adobe, Asana, those yeah. type of ones, I'd keep those open just because there's, that's a really deep question. If, if you can't, can, <laughs> they plug, can they plug in their email? Because yeah, no, I, I, I have that. I have okay, that. cool. Because there's actually a lot of layers to that. And I'll, I would like to present you with option A, option B, mm -hmm. and then you okay. can figure out from there. Perfect. And the other part of the question though, was some of the licenses, I think about the cost for the third party apps and some of them do have additional costs associated with it. Yeah. Cor correct. This is like a lot of marketplaces. If you're edge Chrome uh, browser users, some are free, some are open source. And then there's some that you're like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing. It's, oh, like I need all these features. Oh, it's paywalled. And the publishers do a pretty good job of explaining like, and like, here's a, a jet docs. I don't use this. This is definitely a third party API because you look at who the publisher is here. Microsoft Corporation, Jet. There are some that sit under the radar though. You can really, again, just go exploring down here. And the one thing uh, real quick that I did want to say, if you want to focus in, I want to have questions about, I really just want to keep this in the Microsoft's universe. This is the thing here is that it looks like it's freezing up on me, but Microsoft apps, like the full list of applications is actually not under the Microsoft category. So just so that people know things like communications, which I've heard is a really interesting application integration, you're not going to find this under the Microsoft title. It's actually, I think, under productivity or workflow and business management. Yeah, that's uh, something to just keep in mind is that if you're really set on, if you're really set on Microsoft Corporation apps, they may exist like across the entire catalog. Great. The other question that we got here was, this was an interesting one. I don't know the answer to this from Jason. Within the desktop app, is there a way to auto alphabetize the list of teams? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, so I, I didn't teams, think so either. <laughs> teams, as far as I know with the UI, at least by default, like there might be custom like third-party applications for modding teams. And by their might, I'm going to bet that there are. It typically the hierarchy works by the interface by when it's created. It doesn't go by. Yeah. Okay. And then the other question that we had here was from Kathleen. Is there an, this is one that I've struggled with a little bit myself. Kathleen asks, is there an easier way to toggle between two separate teams, two separate Microsoft 365 accounts besides logging in and out? each time Log logging in and logging out i would run an incognito or private session if you're running on a single monitor for, or, or split screen yeah, yeah that's what i do i actually typically run through three because i have one that i use for just breaking things that i'm trying to learn so yeah i would just use i would just use a private session just because it's not going to cache to that accounts other accounts login yeah, and one thing I would note is I know that this might not be as useful for people who have different Microsoft 365 accounts, but I'm a guest on other people's teams, and that is a little bit easier to toggle between. So I can log into my account and then on my account name or on my, like where it says MA for um, Kevin's thing right now, I can look at that, click on it, and then I can go into my different users and different guests. Yep. I will say like when I'm in a meeting like this, I can't like switch out very easily, but it is something that I'm able to do while I'm working in multiple multiple different teams. And I still get the notifications throughout all of those teams. So I can see if somebody's sending me a notification on one of the other guest teams that I'm a part of. To Kevin's point, I also think that using your desktop app for a primary team that you usually work in, and if you have another account, you can use a browser version for that so that you can log into it. And using the platforms that Teams is available on to distinguish is sometimes helpful as well. Yeah, I know some people are even partial to like the web-based version versus desktop. And so again, yeah. this is really just, I run both of them simultaneously like Trudy. It's just really whatever works best. There's a couple yeah. ways to do it. And I think Wynn had um, similar feedback to us about running one in desktop and one on the browser. There was a question from R.E. Pruitt as well about do, does Teams have time and tracking? Yes, so analytics, log analytics. You can pull those from the Teams admin portal. I don't normally do this, uh, so here we go. Analytics and reports, and then usage reports. Call quality dashboard is if you use uh, Teams calling. I'm definitely not gonna throw anything into the mix uh, with that in this conversation because business voice is probably a meeting in of itself, but if you do use Teams calling, you can use the call quality dashboard. So usage reports are right here. You can also configure Teams um, 
to post analytic information into Power BI if you're a Power BI. There's a question um, that I see from Holly. Is there a cost to talk to someone about Teams at a more basic level? And I just wanted to note here that Holly, one of the assets that we're going to be sending out after this meeting is going to be an offer to sign up for our Teams courses. They actually start with a much more basic level of understanding. It really helps in terms of understanding how to log on to Teams, really like for your team members themselves, how to interact with it. That's um, a course and for everybody that is um, here today, we're going to provide that course for free. So you can use that to you know, get more resources for a basic understanding of Teams. There's a Teams 101 course and a Teams 201 course as well. And we also have content and blogs that I'll show in a few minutes that help talk a little bit about basic usage of Teams as well. But if you have other questions, you can feel free to contact us and we're happy to help. Okay, I just wanted to share, it's not a question, but Wynn had a really good suggestion or learning before. That one thing he's learned is that they have a large folder of photos and he often needs to use a browser to figure out and pick the right photos for marketing purposes and don't necessarily want to house that on um, a local machine. But they look at the thumb, thumbnails of those images a lot in SharePoint, but that hasn't. there's not an easy way to look at that in a thumbnail feature in Teams that he's found of. So... Um, sharing that as a learning, but also just asking Kevin if you've heard of that before. I haven't. As far as the only thing I've dealt with is just general storage of those and offloading those to Azure Blob Storage. That's really the only conversation I've ever had. But to, to that point though, one thing I will say is as a Mac and PC user, is I don't know if you're in a Windows-based environment, but it's it this seems to be a thing. I don't know about anything else. I would love to have a general functionality drop down to just preview like images, which doesn't exist. So I think that while that's not exactly the same thing, I think it speaks to the larger graphical user interface experience. That's just not something I think that's built in, but I'd be happy to look to see what I can find that maybe could be used to configure something like. I think we went through all of the questions that everybody had. Kevin, I didn't know if you wanted to go through the admin slide really quickly, and then I can go over some of the other resources that we have. If you do have any other questions, we have time. So feel free to put those into chat. We definitely have time to address a few more questions as well. Yeah, the, the admin slide was really just. Yeah, considerations. Yeah, exactly. Let me browse here. I think I can pull it up. There was also a question that just came in. Does Teams have a time clock? So there, I think is, that's really interesting that I'll need to look that up because not to name drop other video meeting <laughs> organizations, but Zoom actually does have an integrated time clock that I use. So yeah, so okay, Cindy somebody says, just said. Yes, it's shifts, yeah. Okay, so shifts. That's actually the scheduler. That's what I was looking for earlier. I was also go. for, for <laughs> shifts. So I'm glad that that got brought up. Perfect. That's not the slide we want to be on. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, we, we've covered, I think, to a certain degree, like what these are. Again, settings, policies, templates, and packages. You're an admin. Again, this is going to depend on what it is that you do and then the security approach that you really want to have. I, I don't know. You're just doing, is there a fee for shifts? No, there's not a, there's not a fee for shifts that's integrated. That's actually a Microsoft Corp app. Just, yeah, shifts. I've only integrated like in testing with someone once, so I don't know all the bells and whistles of it, but I do know that it exists. We did have a customer that actually used those for remote inoculation of for the COVID-19 vaccine in like a rural part of California. They actually used shifts for setting the nurses that were performing the inoculations or schedules. So I probably should have gone down the rabbit hole then with him about how he did that, but it just didn't happen. But to the point with this is that again, like understanding that these types of policies like in packages and settings, this is not really, again, this is a part of teams and it's important, especially again, security, what you do, guest access, that's another one because we work with guests, right? So it's not, it's not, it's actually very common. This is also something, and it's like a template that can also be adjusted or addressed across across your tenancy the big thing again like i mentioned earlier was sharepoint we haven't gone down the hole with sharepoint and we're not really going to but just understand that as far as application ends like controlling like data exists primarily through where the two sources of them are like you could do it at the teams level and or you can perform these operations at sharepoint
yeah, I saw something coming in about resources for that. Yeah, no, it was just a question from Cindy. So I'm guessing we're not the right resource for shifts. And I, I was saying, I'm not sure if there are other resources or contact, but I also just wanted to like say, if there's anybody else here who's using shifts, it would be great to connect you guys together. So maybe we can learn from each other as well. Yeah, that's another thing too, is to thank you, Shruti, is uh, the Digital Transformation Forum. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have a question, it's not built for just Microsoft, but like by by all means, I would absolutely recommend posting anything and everything there. The All of the Microsoft Corp and third-party applications, even to a degree, really go in detail of what that application, like how to deploy it and use it. Again, there's probably other resources for that. If you want to know about it, post it to the Digital Transformation Forum on our website, and I will be more than happy to learn about it. Thanks. And then there's a question from Donna, and I'll try to get that link and put it in the meeting chat for the forum as well, about how do you make a poll? Yeah, you, you... So you can, yeah, if you wanna just show them. Yeah, okay. All right, looks like I lost you there for a second. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can Okay, hear. okay. I actually have it integrated. I don't know why it keeps freezing like when I'm sharing my screen, yeah. but if you integrate the forms app into that, I could actually probably go to that and it's not gonna kick me out here. I'll give me one second here. Okay. And while you're pulling that up, I, I see a question from Paul. Does TechSoup have any discounted paid resources to hire administrative support for a small shop? Uh, one to two um, staff and nonprofit board. And I will put that link in here, Paul. We definitely do. We have managed services that we can provide with for nonprofits who want to do that. We also have help desk bundles that you might want to use that might be more appropriate as well. I'll send you some of the resources. So a uh, couple. So forms is one. Let's see if it's going to pull up here. Uh, forms can be used to conduct polls right here and integrates within the user interface. I couldn't share like the actual live screen I was on, unfortunately, for some reason. Uh, forms is one. And then the other one that we actually use is completely free. It's apples and oranges. So it's really whatever one that you like. There's also something actually I've not used this and I'm actually curious if anybody here has. It's called Q&A. And of course, it's not going to pop up, but I know it exists. It's called Q&A. It's probably a typo because of my spelling here, maybe. OK, aired it. Boom. Q&A. Mm -hmm. I, I have no idea what this is, but it sounds very exciting. So again, if you have a desire to have like really interactive, like we do webinars, but we haven't touched live events yet, and maybe we will. But this is this is probably a really robust feature like to level up from like forms or poly into. I, yet again, I have not used it if somebody has. Feel free to chime in. I'd be very curious about what your experience was with that. Okay, great. Uh, I know we're running a little low on time. There's a question from Paul. Can you talk more about sharing multiple calendars with both internal to Teams and with general Outlook users? As far as scenario, I'd probably just like to follow up by email because I think I'm going to go a little bit beyond the, the rest of sure. the time. But yeah, definitely grab an email, post it in the chat if you can, please, because there's a conversation there I think is going to be a little bit longer than five minutes. Okay, great. And then Paul has a follow up. How do we integrate within Teams and outside of team use? So How maybe do, that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, integrate email within Teams. Okay. Yeah. As far as desktop application, there is an integration. I don't, there is one within OWA. I don't really use integration like between those two, and I'm not a desktop user. I was notorious mm -hmm. amongst the customer success team, like that Kevin doesn't use Outlook for desktop. That's just my, way but yeah there's integrations for that and i can talk about i would actually think i'd love to have a, a longer conversation about just even between the two because i think there's maybe some resources that could be created there because calendar extension is is going to be a huge part of this i think for everybody amongst other things and yeah perfect Okay, I know we're getting close to time. This has been a really great session and I've been learned a lot and I hope you guys have too and found this useful. I wanted to just mention a few things before we ended today's session. One uh, was about the team's resources that I talked about. What you will get at the end of, after we finish this meeting, we'll uh, wrap up the recording, the slides, and we'll send an email within the next few days. And 
part of that email will be this free Teams training course. And so you will have access, everybody here will have access to these courses. It's a value of $70 and we're hoping that this will be really useful. This has a basic level course, so this might be a perfect kind of introduction course for getting started with Teams. There's also a few resources that are in here. So outside of the courses, we also have a getting started with Microsoft Teams guide that we've created, a quick start guide, and then you have all of the links here as well. And then the last thing is just a few other resources that might be helpful to you as you're using more of the technology suites that you have. We have getting started guides for your Microsoft Cloud licenses. We have that digital transformation forum. We put that link in the chat as well. But that's a forum that's available to connect with your peers, to connect with other people who are discovering different apps that they might be using and integrating as well. And then definitely want to plug for our next virtual office hours. I'll put that link inside of the chat as well. We're going to do a different format next month. We're going to do an ask me anything. So we're going to do a completely agenda list, if you will, but really just focus on whatever questions that you have. So bring any of the questions that you have. If their questions are related to other TechSoup products or solutions or services, feel free to bring that there. We're going to do our best to answer as much as possible so that you guys get the most out of it. So again, these slides will be sent to you. I think we have a few more uh, minutes left if anybody has any burning questions. Otherwise, we wanted to thank you for your participation today and hope that you have a fabulous weekend.